Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 4th, 2019, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know it hasn't been easy to find a week in charts lately, but if you just go to the link on my website under appearances, you should be able to get in. Should be in keyword nets and it's so what are we talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions got a lot to talk about there. Your questions on trading your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off until we get to the actual charts on those stock picks. And that's for your benefit to make sure that I get to your stock picks. And also ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many stocks as you want. Just ask about each individual stock and then hit return. And that's again for your benefit to make sure that I cover all that you're asking. All right, what are we talk about? Well, this is kind of a working title, but I think it works. Don't confuse the issue with facts. Be a trend following moron. And I never really know exactly what I'm going to talk about, usually ahead of time with these. And last night I got an email, received an email from someone, and they were having a hard time wrapping their head around the market conditions. So I decided that maybe that would be my show today. Let's get back to price and what it is is. While I was talking, disclaimer screen flew by. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So here's the email. Hey, Dave, I've been in the markets since the 80s, traded the dot-com boom well, and this market has me thinking I'm crazy. And tomorrow's session, can you talk about what's supporting, what is supporting this market, or am I just too old for this? I know, stop thinking, just follow price, I guess. Hard for me to hold overnight, but with the endless buyouts based on cheap debt and tax cuts, I guess go with the flow, but I can't help but think we are borrowing on the future. How do I stay in the game? Well, the quick answer is don't confuse the issue with facts. That's a statement I often answer my wife with when she tells me something and she's right but it's true when it comes to the market you really can't confuse the issue with facts and I even bought the domain or a couple of domains similar to this one and I don't know why they don't point back to my website they're supposed to but anyway first of all you're not too old and last week I did a presentation on the the traders paradox and the irony is the longer you're at this business to realize you the more you realize the less you know but just follow along. So the older I get, the less sense the markets make. And the more I realize that I'm nothing but a trend following moron. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, last week's presentation was a lot more about how you have no control over the markets, only you. And the longer you're in this business, the more you realize how little control you have. But that's okay. You just follow along. I know. Easier said than done. So she traded the dot-com bubble. So that tells me right away that many years ago, she knows not to confuse the issue with facts. Now, this got me thinking about the dot-com bubble and a fund that is known for being a value investing fund. Well, let's look at what the dot-com bubble was. We had this stupid rally in the Internet. My wife used to have to have a boss who had two teenage sons and every Monday morning she'd come in and tell him a story about what the kids did over the weekend and she'd go stupid <laughs> just flat out stupid things that they would do well the dot-com bubble was stupid it made no sense but as we'll see in just a few minutes what is is now this Value fund run by a famous person lost about half of its value during the same period. Why? Well, he was confusing the issue with facts, and he didn't buy any of these Internet stocks, which were going straight up, and he continued to buy these value stocks. And I remember back then there was this popular fundamental and technical combo methodology, which was really popular leading up to the dot-com boom. And then the trend-following morons of the world just kept buying these dot-com stocks and were printing money. And 
the creator for this system realized that they better do something quickly because all of these stocks were passing them by. So they scrambled to readjust because there were no fundamentals in all these stocks that were going straight up. And I have a big problem with that, not to take away from the system which did really, which did really well for years, but the problem I have here is they had to make a major change to sort of chase the market as opposed to just following along. Just do it. Follow the trend. So they completely re-changed their whole system and pretty much, I guess in some ways, sort of eliminated the fundamentals. I think they went, and I'm going to show my ignorance, I think they went from bottom line growth to top line growth or something silly like that. So... If it's going up, you want to be buying. This is a recent little IPO trade we talked about in the Facebook group. And the Facebook group is for everyone who's a member of DaveLearner.com. The group is free, but you have to be a member of DaveLearner.com. And that's just to keep the riffraff out. I don't know if you guys have been in these social media groups, but mostly they're full of crap. So I thought it would be fun just for our SNGs to go grab, and this came from Finviz, by the way. I thought it'd be fun to go in and just grab a fundamental thing. And I don't know exactly what all of these numbers are because I don't believe in fundamentals. And trust me, when I got started in this business, I tried to confuse the issue with facts and tried to learn about fundamentals and everything, combine it all together. But I see this negative number here for income. Well, as a business owner, that's probably not a good thing. I can tell you that. This book share, I guess that's a book value. It has a negative book value for share, per share. And the PE does not exist. Why? Well, because there is none, okay? You'd have to have earnings because it's what? Price over earnings. As I often say, people say, hey, Dave, use PE. Yes, I do, but I do not use the denominator. So I just eliminate this. And I used that. Okay. So anyway, the point is that in this, I guess this is earnings per share. So they're losing money. But what are they doing? Well, it went up. Now, there's no guarantees to keep going up. But I did take profits along the way. As did, I think, my peeps. And we're still long this particular stock. Which makes no sense from a fundamental standpoint. So this brings us back to don't confuse the issue with facts. And as we'll see in one minute, what is, is. Now, speaking of bubbles, now that Bitcoin has woken up again, you haven't heard me talk about it for a long, long time. And then back in March, I started talking about it again. Why? Well, it's going up. And back then, then being December of 2017, people were going back and forth on Facebook, and a lot of these financial writers were putting out all this stuff about, ah, oh, it's just BS, it's just BS. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. As I wrote in that article that I have referenced here, it's about halfway there as far as beating the averages for fiat currencies. Now, fiat currency, for those who aren't familiar, is a currency that's not back by anything, such as the U.S. dollar. <laughs> and what's the old saying, the difference between U.S. and Greece and some of these countries that get into a lot of trouble is the size of our printing press. So the point I made in that article was that the average lifespan for a fiat currency, I think, is about 27 years. And we still have a ways to go before we know whether or not Bitcoin is going to beat out the average for fiat currencies, but it doesn't matter. What is, is. And everyone back then, and once again right now, is poo-pooing Bitcoin. Well, Dave, do you believe in Bitcoin? I don't know. It's a bunch of zeros and ones. It's kind of hokey if you ask me. Well, why are you trading it? Well, because it's going up. As I often said, say, a friend of mine years ago said, if Dave heard that intravenous drug use was going up, he would be buying hypodermic needles. Well, that's that's not true. He's suggesting that there would be a fundamental correlation between the two. However, if the price of companies that sold needles was going up, then maybe he's right. Maybe that's 
<laughs> how bad I am, what a, how big of a capitalist I am when it comes to trading. Anyway, everybody's been poo-pooing Bitcoin. Everybody was poo-pooing it back then. Everybody's saying steer, steer clear of it. Now, this is not to say and put your life savings in it. But if you see setups, treat it like any other financial market. So here was my reply when I was printing money in Bitcoin way back then. You can make a lot of money riding a bubble provided that you don't invest your life savings. Again, take some profits along the way. That's some money management. And have a chair ready for when music stops. Again, money management. And it will, by the way. Or you can pontificate while the bubble goes up 10,000% or more. I think in one post I wrote, you can pontificate your brilliance while the bubble goes up 10,000% or more and then has a 10% correction or much more and then say, see, I told you. Now, it's not easy being a trend following moron, but looking smart and making money are two different things in markets. You might want to write that down. I'm wrong a lot. I come out and admit it. I'm not on YouTube like the people who probably have bought ads for this presentation, if you're watching this recording, who make it look like you just go and have breakfast because you just made $10,000. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. I'm wrong a lot, and I admit it. I probably admit it too much. But if I'm right just a little here and there, and... In the here and there, if I'm right big on price and use proper money management for when I'm wrong and for when I'm right, then I'll do okay. And all you need is a few big winners to make a year. Now, here's the Bitcoin. I talked about this in my 322.19 now column, and this was the chart that I showed, and this is where it was. I bought in on a little transitional type of pattern, kind of bottomed out, began to take off from lows, pull back a little bit. And then I flipped out half and had to stop right around break even. And then, as you can see, it took off from there. Now, it could have easily just stopped me out, but I had a plan in place, and I'm following the plan. Now, should Bitcoin have gone up this much? Probably not. Is there any fundamental reason for it going up? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Like John McCain used to interview himself. But it is what it is, is. And I've heard some that the SEC is going to allow for an ETF on it. But all that news was after the fact. Again, what it is, is. Now, one of my reoccurring themes for you people, and it looks like everybody here today has been around for a while, both on Earth and in trading. <laughs> but one of my reoccurring themes when I go to help people is that you know that you know. And this is especially true if you've, now, I've talked about the learning management system before, and if somebody's asked me a bunch of money management questions, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, let's go see where you are in your course. It's like, yeah, I've been meaning to take that course. We'll take the course first and get through it, and if you still have questions, then let's see if we can fill the holes in, but provided that you went through all the courses or and or provided that you have some experience in the markets, then I'd be willing to bet most of the time you know that you know. You know what you're doing wrong. So in this particular case, I know thinking, I know stop thinking and just follow price, I guess. Yes, you know that you know. So she knows she is confusing the issue with facts. Now, as I preach the truth, the light in the way is price. Price does not lie. As I preach, and I keep getting far, further ahead of myself than I intend to, but as I preach, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. Is the market going higher? Is the market going lower? Or is the market just going sideways? You might not like what it's doing, but what is, is. Now, if you ever find yourself fighting trends, confusing the issue with facts, then put the instructions on your arm. And if you get confused, you've got the instructions right there in front of you. Put your arm in front of your monitor and follow along. I know. Can you talk about what is supporting this market? 
Well, never forget, there's only three states in which a market can exist. An uptrend, which is demand. So there is demand for stocks. That's what's supporting this market. In a downtrend, you have what? Supply. So that's what makes stocks go down. Now, sometimes you have equilibrium where demand equals supply. So again, there's the slide I was looking for. It may not be doing what you want, and more often than not, it won't be. There's many presentations that I've done on that. In fact, more often than not, markets go against you. As Greg Morris once said, markets only make new highs about 4% of the time. And I think that's he's talking about the indices. But looking at the indices and the fact that, in general, stocks tend to have a high correlation to the indices, that's probably a pretty true statement. And then the downside of that is, first of all, you're going to have more negative observations than positive ones. And this is especially true if you're looking at the market too much. And I know I just went over and shook my mouse on my, other, on my trading station, which I forced myself to have to physically walk over to to keep me from making too many trades. But the more observations you make, the more negative things you're going to see. And then as I've talked about ad nauseum, from a psychological perspective, a negative emotion has two times the psychological impact of a positive one. So even if you're making money, if you're making a lot of observations, you're creating a lot of negatives, and those negatives are going to be twice the positive. So the point I'm trying to make here, long story endless, is that it may not be what you want it to be doing. In other words, if you're long, you want it to go up. If you're short, you want it to go down. And I guess if you're trading some sort of complex strategy, you might want to you might want to go sideways while your options decay. But that's a whole different story, and that'll work until it don't. But anyway, what is is unless of course you're Bill Clinton. Hard for me to hold overnight, but with the endless buyouts based on cheap debt and tax cuts, I guess I should go with the flow. But I can't help out. But I can't help think we are born from the future. Well, yeah, there's cheap dead and there's tax cuts but so what i can't help but think we're boring from the future well anybody remember ed mcmahon yes you're correct right you are <laughs> he would sit there next to johnny carson who was it phil hartman used to do him on snl i used to work with a few people and they would come in every day and that they would say that over and over anyway i digress and this market has me thinking I'm crazy. You're not crazy. This reminds me of what the economist Keynes once said. Markets can stay irrational a lot longer than you could stay solvent. Now, Susan's a trend follower, so she's not betting against the markets. But her point is, is, she's cra is she crazy? It's like, no, she's not crazy. And you have to realize that many of fortunes have been lost for being right, but early. If you haven't seen The Big Short, I recommend you watch it. I enjoyed it very much, as I often say. Don't watch it with someone who, who does not understand markets, because you feel like you will be, be compelled to explain to them what's going on. And you'll aggravate them. And if they do, if they do find themselves interested in the movie they'll bug you to death asking a bunch of questions so make sure you watch it first <laughs> with someone who understands markets or if you watch it with someone who doesn't understand markets make sure it's your second time through otherwise you'll both be aggravated anyway in that movie he was betting against all these debt stuff that just was stupid and should not be solvent okay and he was right, but early. And then the investors came in and said, that's the same thing, Michael. He said he's not wrong. I'm sorry. He said he's not wrong. He's right, but early. Well, that's the same thing, Michael. So many of fortunes have been lost by confusing the issue with facts, by being right, but early. Now, she said it's hard for her to hold overnight. Well, that's where the money is. As I preach, the real money is in longer-term trading. But Dave, you swing trade. 
I do swing trade, but I take partial profits and I stick with that position as long as it moves in my favor. Now, I do admittedly the occasional ogre trade, which we've talked a lot about in the recent questions and answer session. So go in and watch all those to get up to speed on that, especially on trading only the best ones. And that is a day trade. But that's just for S and G's. The real money is in the longer term trading. So just using the two examples that I'm showing in this presentation, the Bitcoin, this is a daily chart. You can see that I held on for about seven or eight days until I got my profit out. And then I've been holding on for, I guess, a month or so to continue that longer term trend. And percentage wise, I don't know what that move is. It might be 40, 50 percent, but it's, it's significant. And if you go look at this little IPO we just talked about that has absolutely zero fundamentals or even the opposite of zero fundamentals, negative fundamentals, you can see that it's gone up about, I guess, about 30 percent since we began talking about it in the Facebook group. And that move took a few days. Now, maybe you could have gotten a little day trade out of this, but the real money is in those longer term trends. And sometimes I'll hold stocks for weeks, months. And occasionally, not that often, but occasionally years. And I just let the money management take me out when I am truly wrong. All right. Any questions on any of that? Any thoughts? So the bottom line is what is, is don't confuse the issue with facts. Now, just real quick, I've, been talk I've talked about this quite a bit. So earlier I just said about if you've been trading for a while, you know what you're doing wrong. And this was kind of part of what I was thinking in this members area of the website, the learning management system. And I've ended up with carpal tunnel in two hands from answering people over the last 20 years. And I have to have elbow surgery because of nerve damage from all that. <laughs> so I was about a year too early. I'm sorry, a year too late in this learning management system. But the bottom line is I think I've created something special here. And if we come in and we see your money management, you've only completed like maybe 5% of the money management course, then maybe it's a money management problem, okay? If you have only completed about 10% of the mindset, in other words, trading psychology, maybe it's a mindset problem. And if you completed all of them and you're still having some trouble, then we can flesh that out in the Q&A. Now, the thing is, I wanna make sure I fill in all the holes and you tell me what you want, and I put it in the Q and A. So, and here are your courses down here. These are all the member courses I was talking about. And by the way, the premium courses up here will be unlocked in time. So, the longer you stay a member, the closer you get to unlocking these. And that way, you have everything. You should have everything you need. If you don't, then ask me, and then I'll add it. Anyway, that's the members area. Check it out. Just click on the members button on my homepage, Dave Landry. Dot com. Now, let me get the charts up and running. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so. So what I want to do first is I want to take a look at the S&P 500. And then I want to drill down and take a look at some sector action. And we probably should take a look at bonds while we're at it. There's a couple things I want to point out here, obviously. Let's see if we can get this a little bit bigger. Oh, my geez. Oh, geez. Oh, talk amongst yourselves. Looks like I jinxed the TIGR. Anytime I talk about a stock, it starts going down. All right, let's take a look at the S&P 500. And then I want to take a look at some of the, the major MIGs. And people always say, Dave, what's a major MIGs? Morningstar Industry Groups, which comes with TC. First of all, let's take a look at the P's. Nothing to, my, nothing to write home about today. In fact, we're in Flatsville. Yesterday, we had a bit of an opening gap reversal. I actually played it in both the SPXS and in the TVIX. And I'll show you that in just one second. But we had a gap open yesterday. This one wasn't really cut and dry. It didn't trigger until later in the day. So I guess technically it wasn't an opening gap reversal. I don't want to focus too much on the micro here. Let me just show you what happened. And I'll show you why I'm talking about these. And again, if you go into the learning management system, you can see I talked about it quite a bit, but what I did was I allowed it to open and I had my entry down here and then it triggered, rallied up and then sold off and it pretty much scratched out. I think it was a small loss on that. The T VIX actually worked out okay. 
didn't set the world on fire. But I took the TVIX trade, and it had a little bit better opening gap reversal. It turned out okay. And the reason I took the TVIX was that it was, and I'm gonna, I think I'm going to flesh this out in a lot more detail next Wednesday in the Q&A sessions. By the way, anybody know how to get rid of it? I can't get rid of this down here on this newer computer. Anybody tell me how to do that? I'll give you 50 bucks. Good at DaveLander.com. <laughs> uh, anyway, you can see we had a little opening gap reversal. But what I liked here was when the VIX gets stretched away from its moving average, it tends to revert back to the mean. But, Dave, I thought you wanted to reverse to the mean player. Well, the VIX works more like volatility. It, it, well, because it is volatility, which tends to expand and contract and reverts to its mean. And what I'm doing is I'm actually taking a price signal off of the S&P 500, and I'm looking at the chart to see if there's a way to trade like the VIX. And you can see in this particular case, when it gets stretched away from its moving average, 10% or more, which you can look up in Dave Landry on Swing Trading, I think. Yeah, Dave Landry on Swing Trading I had some systems in there that were VIX based. I'm using the T-VIX because it's a day trade. Anyway, uh, you can see a bit of an opening gap type reversal there yesterday. It really didn't print money or anything, but better than the poke in the eye. I was hoping for more of a pop higher. Anyway, before I digress too far, I'm going to talk about all of that next Wednesday in the Q&A. When you do trade these opening gap reversals, you're much better off trading them on the fringe, like right here where you're making new highs for the year, or if the market is set up like right here, okay? Be careful when you're trading them within a range. They don't work quite as well, and a lot of times not at all. But it's hard to sit and wait for these things to occur. Anyway, before I digress too far, let's go back to the action of the piece. Up a smidge today, nothing to write home about. We're kind of in a little bit of a drifting mode in here, just kind of drifting higher. And longer term, we've had this big run from lows. Now, I've had long and drawn out discussions on overbought, oversold. And again, that's I keep coming back to the Q&A. We discussed that in a lot in the Q&A. But I did one Q&A a few weeks back where I talked about overbought, oversold. And look, we've ran since the December lows, we ran 22%. That's a lot for an index. A lot of times an index doesn't go 22% in a year. A lot of times it doesn't go 10% in a year. And sometimes, obviously, it's negative for the year. So that big of a run over that short period of time is overbought. If you want to use indicators, that's fine. Be careful using indicators, though, because if it's an unbound indicator, then it can keep going on forever. If it's a bound indicator, then it's always going to look like it's overbought or oversold. So it gets really tricky fast. Just use indicators to help you, but always come back to price, if you must use indicators, that is. Anyway, I feel a lot better. If we went on to make new highs and stay there, my big problem is when you have these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, okay? Let's back this chart out a little bit. My big problem is by the time the market gets all the way back up to its prior highs, it's already overbought. Well, it's already overbought now. So it's kind of like running a marathon right after you ran a marathon. I mean, maybe you could do it, but it's going to be a lot harder than if we had some sort of price equilibrium, in other words, sideways action for a while, so the market can digest its gains. Now, stranger things have happened, but that's my big concern with the overall market. You've got this big V-shaped recovery at a very high level, and one has to wonder – or we're going to end up in some sort of big picture topping process. But right now, I'm mostly long. So I'm just, what, following along. I think I'm 100% long. And when I say mostly long, I just mean that not my whole portfolio is invested, but 
what is is long. It might be 43% in or something like that, but who's counting? All right, now is that composite off a smidge today? It did get past its recent highs. It made new highs for the year yesterday. Looking pretty good over the intermediate term, short term overbought, but also overbought on the intermediate term and not too far away from all time highs. But obviously, you still have to get there. Let's talk about the Rusty. Now, the Rusty, Rusty has been a big concern of mine for a while. The other indices all had this big picture retrace to them. But they've taken out their recent highs, the S&P 500, for instance, and the NASDAQ. But the Russell 2000 so far has stalled out and so far kind of rolling over a little bit. But if we have one or two good weeks in here, or even a few really, really good days, then we might be okay. All right, so let's... So here's a daily chart, and you can see again, if you want to dissect things a little bit, we're kind of overbought shorter term, but not so much a little bit longer term with the Russell 2000. My big concern is, again, it's like thrust, sell-off, retrace, and thrust lower. Now, it would negate that if we got above 160, so let's hope, and I know you said hope, we get above 160. Unfortunately, if we do get above 160, then we still have some overhead supply. So the Russell 2000 still has its work cut out for it. So all is great in the world. Let's take a look at some sector action. Energies have a lot of overhead supply to deal with, and they're kind of messing around a little bit. But they're right around these recent little peaks in here. Let's take a look at the metals real quick. Metals have broken out a bit, but they're pushing into this overhead supply. So that's a little bit concerning. The banks looked abysmal just a little while ago, but now they're retracing back up. You can see they began to implode in here, but now they're going straight back up. Let's take a look at what rates are doing. Speaking of banks, you can see that the Treasury, bond, bleh, the Treasury bond broke out and so far has pulled back. It's a commodity related error. I'm not going to get too excited about those gaps. So it looks okay. It looks like bonds are actually headed higher, which would mean, what, Susan? Lower rates, which would mean cheap debt. And I don't know. you got to be careful you start connecting too many dots and confusing issue with facts. But, yes, bond prices for now look like they're headed higher. In fact, I've been looking to play an opening gap reversal in bonds. What is it, TMF maybe? Let's take a look at that real quick, TMF. But we really didn't get it yesterday. And unfortunately, we're not really getting it today. But if we get a gap down, maybe down to 20 or so and see a big reversal, it might be worth a shot. Let's take a look at financials. Financials look kind of questionable a few days ago, but now they're coming back with a vengeance. And they're not too far from these multi-year highs. I'm sorry, multi-month highs, new highs for the year. But even if we get there, they still have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. Now, there are some areas that have come back nicely as of late. There's a transport not too far from these. New highs in here, overbought problems I've been discussing at nauseam do apply there. Some areas like software have broken out in here decisively, and that's kind of a sort of a V-shaped recovery at a high level that survives. So you can't just say that, well, it can't go up. The market can do whatever it wants. I've been encouraged by the action in the semiconductors lately. We're right at these multi-year highs. I don't think it's all-time highs, or is it? Let's take a look at a monthly chart real quick. We have time. Yeah, yeah, it's all time highs. Okay, I'll be darned. So somehow it climbed the wall worry and got through all this overhead supply. And we're right here at multi month highs. So we'll have to see if we have any setups setting up there soon. Utilities, as you would expect, doing pretty good because rates are so far headed lower, just the opposite of where logically they should be going, right? Anyway, without boring you too much, that's a sector action. For the most part, most are doing pretty good at or near new highs for the year, like the market itself. Some notable areas breaking out nicely. A couple of the areas, like financials and banks, lagging a bit, but coming back as of late. So sector action looking okay. All right, let's open up for individual stocks. Now, LIFT, I did a 
column a few, is it a few years ago? I think it was a few years ago on Blue Apron. And right now it's on my website. So let me just show you where that is. Let's uh, share my browser. So right here, yet another crappy IPO that could have easily been avoided with this simple setup. And there's also some YouTubes on this too. But the thing you want to look for in IPOs, especially these hot, super hyped IPOs like Lyft or Blue Apron or Snapchat, is that, as Will Rogers says, if they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, he was being a little tongue-in-cheek, but there is some truth to that when it comes to IPOs. And I ask myself, since a stock is a new stock and doesn't have a whole lot of trading history, and if it's going to go up, it'll go up from the beginning, quite possibly. Could I just buy the ones that go up and avoid the ones that go down? Now, you can't short them when they're fresh to the market. So that's even though a lot of them just come public and die, you can't short them, unfortunately, unless you're some sort of insider. But that's complicated. Insider meaning like a market maker or something, short them to get supply. But the bottom line is usually within the first week of trading, the first five bars, the significant high or low, and sometimes both, is set. And in many, many, many cases, such as Blue Apron, which stalled out on day one, or Lyft, which stalled out on day one, day one is that significant new high. So read this article when you get a chance. Snapchat, one of those stupid stocks, Dave, are you confusing the issue with facts? No, no, no. I, if it had gone up, then I may have bought it. But I see no reason to get excited. A little, uh, if it had gone up, I may have bought it. <laughs> but you can see on day two, it found its high. So my rule for IPOs is give them a week to establish themselves. The early earliest I will get into an IPO is the close of day five. And I'll just show you the Tigger real quick. So Tigger, and again, this was covered in a lot of detail in the Q&A. And the, when an IPO sets up within the core methodology, in other words, like a pullback or whatever, I'll put them in the core methodology. Right now, I don't have anything official for IPOs, but we have been talking about them quite a bit in the Facebook group. So if you haven't joined that, you got to be a member. But if, if you have, if you're a member, you have joined it, please, please join it. Okay, day one, day two, day three, day four. So the rule is day five, if it's a new closing high, and the high for the week was not set on day one, which you can see this high was exceeded right there. So believe it or not, you're just buying a close. That's after five days of trade. If they don't go up, what do you do? Don't buy them. So... Even though Will Rogers was being a little tongue-in-cheek, he has a point. So let's get back to Lyft. So what happened on day one? Well, so far it has imploded. Now, I'm not going to bottom fish on this. I'm going to let this one go on to make new highs or let it bottom out for six to eight months. And then if it sets up as some sort of transitional pattern, then I'm going to revisit it. But I see no reason to go after this IPO without going into a lot of detail. One of the things that I said a few years back, I think it was 2014 when I released the IPO course, and it's all still relevant today, which is cool. You know, always when I release something, I always get nervous as to stop working. But what's cool that it's cool that it's still working today. But one thing I said back then, way back in 2014, was if the price too high, they're gonna die. The market maker needs to leave a little bit of meat on the bone. There's a lot of people, and it's going to be hard to explain in detail in this forum, but let's just say there's a lot of people who are on the hook, who want to get off quickly. You've got people with sweat equity in the company who have some of this equity in this IPO. you got other people that are looking to get whole. you got VCs. That's venture capitalist, not Viet Cong. <laughs> And they're looking to get out to get whole or whatever. So there's a big vested interest in an IPO succeeding. 
And if they price it too high, they don't leave enough meat on the bone for those people to get off the hook. And it can get ugly pretty quick. So that's if you have to wrap your head around why, that's why. But the bottom line is everything I do is empirical. And then, then I later back in sometimes, not all the times, but I later back into the reasoning on these things. So as far as lift, I would avoid it for now. Feel free to bring it up later. But for now, I don't see anything there worth going after. And my rule is also day one high. If the high for the week is set on day one, which so far, one, two, three, four, five. Today would be the fifth day of trading. So, yes, unless we had the mother of all rallies today, but that's your high. So, in order for me to trade it early to process like this, in other words, a pioneer setup, it would have to take out that high. So, and then do something phenomenal. But that's lift. All right. Any other questions? Any other stocks that you guys want to take a look at? Quite a bunch today. So, yeah, Frenchie, hold off on that. All right, going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email at dave at davelandry.com. We don't talk to you now and then. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.